What's up guys, my name is Hugh Miller and welcome to part 2 of the Nancy Drew game development series. Today we're going to be discussing how a Nancy Drew game works and the many components that a Nancy Drew game consists of from the opening intro and main menus to the many puzzles and animations within the games. The goal of this video is to provide a better sense of how much work went into creating the Nancy Drew games before Midnight in Salem. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to be focusing on Nancy Drew Sea of Darkness. Just like the last video, here's a bit of a disclaimer. I've never worked for Her Interactive. I never got the chance to visit the company, although Her Interactive if you're watching this one as well. Uh, I still want to come visit you guys. I never got the chance to visit and see a game through partial development. All the information provided is coming right from videos or blog posts created by Her Interactive, speaking with past and present Her Interactive employees, or from information gathered from the Nancy Drew game files themselves. In this video, I'll be breaking down the steps of development into a basic form, as well as discussing all the layers within the games. Specifically, Sea of Darkness will be the point of discussion today. If you missed the last video, or haven't already seen it, I highly suggest watching it as it may help you understand some of the things I talk about in this video. But, if you're too lazy, here's a bit of a dictionary for various things that may come up in this video. Scenes are the 2D image renders of 3D environments. Nodes are areas of the game where you can spin in one 360 degree area. HIS refers to the sound files used in the games. It's locked. Bink video files are the video files used in the games for each scene, cutscene, looping animation, and character mm. animation. Being his friend has a price here. You are either outside or inside in Skiprot. The SIF tree is a file which can store hundreds, sometimes thousands, of image and script files in one very compressed format. The Nancy Drew games may not always look it from the outside, but they are incredibly complex games created with immense quality shown in the lack of bugs, richness in art detail, and overall gameplay experience. This is an amazing achievement since Her Interactive was producing two, sometimes three games a year for 14 years, often with a team of less than 25 people. Let's dive into the development structure of these games. Back in 2001, Her Interactive started a new two-game-a-year formula. They stayed true to this formula for 14 years without fail. It really showed how driven and diligent the team was. For this next part, I want to give a huge shout-out to Little Jackalope of the Amateur Sleuth blog. You can check her out at her YouTube channel called Story Retold. The link for that is in the description. And to past Her Interactive executive producer Robert Riedel for helping me understand Her Interactive's previous development cycle. Before we dive in, keep in mind that this schedule is very rough and quite often many of these jobs were being done at the same time. In other words, they wouldn't just be completing one task at a time. They'd be working on around five tasks in one go in order to make sure everyone's staying on schedule and working on their respective parts of the game so they could get two games out every year. Each game started with a design team. They would brainstorm game ideas and eventually pick one to make into a real game. From there, the designers, programmers, and writers would outline the game design plan and schedule. The lead designer would then begin researching information for the theme, educational aspects, and puzzles in the game. Once that's been completed, the designer would then communicate the results to the rest of the team. After that, they would move on to early building. Once the base has been laid out, artists would use the information to start modeling, texturing, and building scenes and character concepts. From there, the writer would start working on character dialogue and the script. Next, the designer polishes out and revises errors or issues in the game's logic. In the last video, some viewers expressed an interest in seeing more of what the plot tracking, or flowchart, would look like. Unfortunately, I can't offer much. I managed to find an excerpt of the flowchart for Secret of the Old Clock. This is the closest example that I could find that represents what Kathy Reuter is working on in this video clip. Once that's been completed, the artist would then finish the 3D models of the characters. Within that, that includes having them modeled, textured, and rigged. He runs his mouth, and I can no longer bear it. He should have been out of my place years ago, but I let him stay. While still building the game, the programmers would use early artwork and placeholder positions to build the code around scenes and puzzles. At this point, the first half of the puzzle art is sent to the programmers to build. As they're being developed, the designer and testers test the puzzles out to make sure they work. At this point, the script is finished, and the actors are schooled and recorded. From there, the programmers and animators implement voice files and connect them to conversation file names. Once that's been completed, the second half of the puzzles are done and they're ready for testing. Next, the team would go and create animation scenes. Throughout the whole cycle, the programmers continue building scenes as artists finish finalizing them. The programmers, artists, and testers find bugs, make revisions, and fix issues. And once that's done, the game is finished. From the time the game is finished until the game launches, the marketing team takes over and works on getting the game rated for ESRB, preparing screenshots, the box art, the trailer, 
product pages, and getting the game ready for pre-orders. When the time comes, the marketing and sales team would launch the game on the websites and continue to monitor pre-orders and promotions. Finally, the game is released. After the game has been launched, the Her Interactive team watches and reads reviews and takes notes. At this point, the designers have already finished the early research and planning for the next game. And from there, the cycle just loops. Alright, this is the coolest part of the video. This is where I take a scene from Sea of Darkness and explode it. Now, I, I don't mean take an RPG to the scene, I mean I'm going to take every single image, animation, if included, sound effect, and music track, and show how many objects are on screen and how much audio is playing at one time. Let's take a look at this scene. This is the entrance to the village in Sea of Darkness. How many items do you think are on screen right now? How many music tracks and sound effects do you hear? Let's take a look. Alright, let's pause the video here. One of the first things you'll notice after we freeze the video is that the snow has stopped moving. As everything else appears to be stationary, that means that the snow is the only animation on screen. Now the way this was created and coded to work was through a sprite sheet. A sprite sheet is an image made up of multiple other images and put together in an orderly format. For instance, this is what the snow sprite sheet looks like. The programmers made the game take this image, cut it up into individual snowflakes, then have them randomly spawn just off screen and have gravity affect it so it looks like the snow is falling. Before we clear the snow off the screen, I'm going to mention that the text objects, aka how much money we have, all the tasks and notes, etc., aren't actually physical objects in the game. They are lines of text that have been written into a file that the game is reading and displaying. Okay, now we can get rid of the snow and the text. Next, let's look at the graphical user interface, or the GUI for short. This is what many players might recognize as the control center of the game. Believe it or not, what you're looking at is made up of tons of images that you can and cannot see. Let's explode the GUI and take a look. Here, you can see the overall interface frame, a small dialog box, the cell phone icons, task and note tabs, multiple components of the task list hint system, the menu and trophy buttons, and the inventory scroll bar. Inserted into all of that are a bunch of various inventory items which have a default and hover state. Notice how there are two cell phone icons, menu buttons, up and down arrows, hint and note system buttons, and trophies. That is because they're all part of a two-frame animation sequence. In other words, when you move your mouse over top of those items, their animation frame will change. Depending on what's clicked, a sound effect or line of dialogue may also play. Haven't done that. Check. Let's take a look at all these inventory items while we're here. We got a bunch of stuff in our inventory, all with two frame animations as well. Those two frame animations can also be referred to as states. For instance, when your cursor is over an inventory icon, it changes to a hover state as the cursor is hovering over the icon. When the cursor isn't over the icon, it's in its default state. When most of these items are clicked, they are added to your cursor image. In earlier games, your cursor would simply become that item that you click on. In the more recent games, they just become part of the cursor. Speaking of cursors, let's talk about them. Yes, that's them, which implies that there are more than one. Why? Because this particular scene has multiple hotspots. A hotspot is a part of the scene that, when the cursor's over it, changes the cursor style. Quite often it means that it's an area you can click on and something will happen. For example, there's a hotspot here, 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 and here. When the cursor is hovering over any of these hotspots, the game logic will call the change of the cursor. In this particular scene, when the cursor is over these various hotspots, we have the option to turn left, go forward, turn right, turn around, or use the inventory dock. Because of that, the game has a few cursors loaded and ready for action. The game also needs to know which scene to load depending on which navigational hotspot you click on. If we zoom out, these are the various scenes that we can travel to from this specific scene. If we decide to move forward, we will load this scene. If we want to go to the left, we'll see this scene, and right, and backwards. This would be part of a scene map, something that the developers would come up with before they stitch everything together. To have a better idea of what I'm talking about, here's an example of a scene map from the development of the daily device. Awesome. Now let's move on to the actual scene itself. All that we have left now is the rendered scene image. However, depending on what point you're at in the game, this scene may look different. For example, now, the heater is knocked over and there are a bunch of footprints. The funny thing about this is that they didn't render a whole new scene just for this small change. Instead, they only rendered the part that was changed. This is what I mean. Within the sift tree for C is this smaller image. When the heater gets knocked over, the game knows that this image needs to be displayed in this particular location until the heater gets put back up. 
Finally, we'll discuss the audio that can be heard in this scene. Let's just listen to it without any visuals for a moment. What did you hear? What kind of soundscape was being played? The loudest of the sounds is obviously the waves. If we mix a bit of wind in with that, we're starting to get somewhere. We also heard some music, particularly the track titled Proud People. Dispersed every so often are the sounds of a foghorn, and some fog bells. And way in the distance, and incredibly low in volume, are some creaks from the Helikide. All of this combined creates a soundscape perfect for where the player is currently positioned relative to the ocean, the boat, and the mountains. So, with all that in mind, if we take all those elements, all those images and sounds and animations and put them together, we get a single scene in a Nancy Drew game. That really just covers the surface of everything we see when we play. The next step would be to dissect the code, but unfortunately we can't exactly just break the game open and look at it. Perhaps one day, but not today. Her Interactive really showed how much they care about these games in the visible and audible details. They took about six months to make, but the amount of work and polish that went into these games is incredible. A consistently immersive experience like this is rare in games, and Her Interactive pulled it off for 17 years. But yeah, that about wraps it up for this series. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope these videos gave you a better sense of what these games are made of, as well as a bit of an explanation of how they work. What did you find most interesting about the development of these games? Is there anything you'd like to know more about? Let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a wonderful rest of your day.